Um, hello, everyone. Good, good afternoon. Uh, Hi. My name is Marcin Gaik, and I'm assistant professor at the American Studies Center, University of Warsaw. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this event. Uh, professor Grzegorz Kość was supposed to uh, offer those opening remarks, but unfortunately, due to some technical problems, he, he he's unable so to do so. Uh, now, this lecture is a part of our special guest lecture series that we hold at the American Studies Center almost every two weeks, uh, where we invite speakers from uh, different foreign academic institutions, diplomatic missions, uh, non-governmental organizations, so they can share their knowledge, their expertise uh, related to American history, politics and society and culture with our students. And uh, because of the current circumstances, of course, we uh, had to organize this lecture online, which, uh, as you all know, has certain drawbacks, but also has some advantages. And, and obviously, one of the advantages is that, thanks to this, the event is easily available to uh, many people, especially students from all over uh, Poland and, and the world, not just from the Warsaw area. Now. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, both students and faculty members. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor David Jones. Uh, I see Ambassador Richard Schnepp among, among the participants as well, Professor Anna Mazurkiewicz. Uh, I'd like to welcome and thank uh, Mrs. Data Milewska and uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Blumenthal from uh, US Embassy Warsaw for uh, their contribution in organizing this event. And finally, uh, let me welcome our uh, main speaker today, that is Mr. Richard Payne Holmes from U.S. Embassy Warsaw. Um, Richard holds uh, MA degree from uh, in Russian Studies and Public Administration uh, from Indiana University. And prior to his assignment in Warsaw, uh, he held numerous diplomatic posts in countries such as Russia, uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, as well as Trinidad and Tobago. And currently, he serves as external political unit chef at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw. Now, before we before he starts, uh, let me quickly explain how this meeting would, will look like. So we will start with uh, Mr. Bainholm's speech. Uh, he will this will take approximately 20 minutes. And then after that, we will have another 20 to 30 minutes for questions and answers. Now, questions, preferably in Pol in English, should be typed in the chat window. We want to avoid too many people speaking simultaneously. So please uh, type your questions into the chat window. If there's too many of them, I will select some of them and ask Richard to reply. Uh, please keep your microphones off uh, by clicking the button in the bottom of, of, of the screen. I think that turning your cameras off as well could improve the quality of a connection, but I don't think it's necessary. Definitely, Richard should not turn his camera off. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as I've already mentioned, this event is video recorded. And I think that's it. So now, finally, uh, let me uh, invite Mr. Payne Holmes to start his talk on the US foreign policy in Eastern and Central Europe. OK, thank you very much. Um, I hope not to talk straight for 20 minutes. Uh, it doesn't seem like that long ago that I myself was a student, um, either a graduate student or a, a student at university, attending these sorts of events uh, live in person. And uh, the, the best aspect of these sorts of events is, of course, the interaction and the free flow of ideas. So I, I'll try to read my very formal diplomatic speech because I am a diplomat. But I think the true value added will be, of course, the discussion we have afterwards. So I will, I will endeavor not to take a full 20 minutes in my own remarks. But first, let me thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's, it's really an honor uh, to be here. And this is, I think, quite possibly the best part about uh, my work as a diplomat, being able to interact um, with various parts of you know, the given society where I'm assigned. My previous assignments, uh, as you mentioned, um, were typically throughout the former Soviet Union in countries that don't enjoy uh, the sort of freedom that Poland enjoys. So I was frequently not able to interact uh, at universities with uh, members of academia and students in some of those countries. So for me, it's, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be able to do that today. 
Um, it's, it's especially an honor to be here doing that in Poland and to be able to interact with students in Warsaw, Gdańsk, Lublin, and elsewhere has been, has been mentioned. Um, it doesn't seem that long ago. In fact, it was only 13 years ago that I myself was a student here in Warsaw at your uh, National School of Public Administration, which is not that far now from, from where I live and work. And so I was here as a student, as a graduate student studying the EU, and your country was a fairly new member of the EU still at that point. And so it's been very interesting me for, for me to be able to contrast my visit uh, in 2007 to my time here working now to contrast the advances and improvements and the changes that we made in Poland since that point. So thank you again for, uh, for letting me be here and I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, speaking of things that have happened some time ago, uh, it, it really seems only like yesterday um, that many of the countries in Central Europe, in, including Poland, which had already traditions of independence, um, liberated themselves from communist tyranny and Soviet domination. Uh, countries like Poland showed the rest of the world the way to freedom. Uh, they showed us a way to liberty and free markets. And a few years later, after 1989, several countries that had been forcibly incorporated in the Soviet Union, nations like uh, the Baltic states, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and others, achieved their own independence. And of course, I don't have to tell you, um, the, the freedom of nations like Poland um, were won first and foremost as a result of their own effort. Um, not too long ago, President Donald Trump was in Warsaw in 2017, and he said, the captive nations of Europe endured a brutal campaign to demolish their freedom, faith, laws, history, and identity, the very essence of their culture and humanity at the hands of a cruel and wicked system that impoverished their cities and their souls. Uh, in their battle against communism, these nations were supported, nations like Poland were supported by a strong alliance of free nations in the West that defied tyranny, and I'm proud to say that um, that coalition, that alliance included the United States. Um, when their freedom came, it was the result of a very fierce competition, a long struggle for mastery in which the United States um, brought great resources to bear in the defense of freedom in some of these countries. Today we can see there is a new competition uh, for influence in the world as outlined by the United States' national security strategy, uh, the return of big power competition is a defining geopolitical fact uh, or factor of our time. The need to systematically prepare for this competition is now uh, the central task of U.S. foreign policy and therefore uh, diplomats like me were posted abroad. And the geopolitical competition is felt, I must say, rather acutely in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, from the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic Sea and across the Balkan Peninsula and throughout the Caucasus. Uh, our rivals, that is the rivals to the United States, are expanding their political, military, and commercial influence. Um, Russia, of course, is uh, again a military factor in these regions. Um, we only need to look to Ukraine and Georgia to see illustrations of this fact. While, countries of, uh, while in the countries of Central Europe, Russia continues to use coercive energy tactics, corruption, and propaganda, often in the form of disinformation, to weaken Western nations, from within and undermine their bonds to my country, the United States. And a new development, for the first time in history, China has become a major player in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Beijing uses what some are calling debt book diplomacy to accumulate infrastructure and force concessions on smaller nations. We see this um, used um, particularly in Africa, but uh, Central Europe is also no stranger to Chinese influence through finance and other means. Uh, these tactics mirror Chinese behavior at the international level, where Beijing engages in unfair trade practices, including intellectual property theft and economic espionage of various forms and varieties. In 2008, China invested only not even uh, $1 billion in Europe. Just nine years later, in 2017, Chinese uh, foreign direct investment in Europe totaled $42 billion, and its, uh, the total of its, all of its investment was $318 billion. So that's quite an increase in just a few years. And in more recent years, China has taken control of 360 European companies and now owns or controls almost a tenth of Europe's entire port capacity. Now, part of the reason that our rivals, and I mean China and Russia again, uh, are gaining ground in Central and Eastern Europe is that for too long, we in the West did not take competition in these regions seriously. After the Cold War, it was uh, common 
um, to read among um, academics, think tank types, um, persons in government, the US government, for instance, to believe that history had ended and that enduring realities like geography, history, uh, and issues of nationality no longer mattered or would play a role uh, in international affairs. Uh, many of us in the West simply overlooked the foundational importance of the nation state and national sovereignty as uh, key sources along with natural law from which political legitimacy ultimately uh, derives. So international institutions came to be seen as ends in themselves rather than instruments that must bring security and relevance to the lives of the citizens they serve. Meanwhile, uh, the strategic realities uh, upon which post-World War, World War II institutions were built were shifting all around us. And even a casual look today at a map uh, should lead us to question the assumptions that animated past policies and turn our attention to the urgent task of strengthening the West um, in order to contest the growing influence of our rivals. This task begins uh, at Europe's far frontier in supporting states that are struggling to assure their continued independence. Uh, the dangers to former Soviet republics, um, countries like Ukraine and Georgia, are direct and existential. Uh, they constitute both military threats to inter territorial integrity and sovereignty and efforts to unravel the democratic institutions that their citizens are attempting to build. In Central Europe, on the other hand, the threat is uh, of a degree of political and economic penetration that with time could degrade national independence and splinter our valued uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, otherwise known as NATO. Our strategy in the United States toward these regions is guided by certain principles, and I'd like to lay those out for you now. First, as outlined by our national security strategy, the United States will compete um, for positive influence abroad. Despite our own problems, we remain a powerful democracy whose example uh, continues to draw others to us. Um, nevertheless, we cannot take it for granted or see it as a foregone conclusion that countries will, especially those in Europe, will automatically remain friendly to the United States. Um, doing so requires active diplomacy. China and Russia, uh, for their own part, are engaged in a diplomatic full court press in sensitive regions around the world and we, the United States, must match their efforts or expect to, be, to lose in this contest. Uh, where we will always be clear about the principles that, while we will always be, excuse me, clear about the principles that undergird our democracy, we have to be willing to use diplomacy to aggressively advance the national interest, the U.S. national interest. So not only by engaging countries with whom we agree, but we must engage countries with whom we have serious differences. Um, differences that can be exploited by these rivals uh, to increase their own influence. Uh, success in this competition for influence also requires us to increase commercial engagement. Uh, for China and Russia, promoting commerce is already uh, an integral and well-established part of their diplomacy. I think you've probably all heard about China's um, Belt Road Initiative, uh, which seeks long-term influence by buying infrastructure, often with financial backing from the Chinese government. Uh, to a much greater extent than in the recent past, uh, the United States must also treat the promotion of U.S. business as inextricably linked to the future of our nation's strength and influence abroad. Uh, to that end, just by way of example, um, the U.S. government, uh, in support of uh, the so what we're calling the Bipartisan Build Act, um, is restructuring the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, also known as OPIC, um, so that has the authority and resources to offer countries viable private sector alternatives to Chinese financing. So working with the U.S. Congress, um, the White House, and the executive branch of our government uh, plan to double the existing portfolio capacity of OPEC from $29 billion up to $60 billion, allowing the United States, therefore, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with major rivals in vulnerable regions like Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in tandem, we're strengthening our public diplomacy efforts. Um, what we call soft power in Central Europe. One of our greatest competitive advantages against authoritarian rivals is our story and our legacy as a democratic, generous, and entrepreneurial people and country. In Central Europe, uh, we have many natural friends and a shared history of fighting tyranny that goes back to the time of the American Revolution. Um, to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the fall of communism last year, for instance, we launched a year-long program of events uh, including outreach and increased youth exchanges across Central and Eastern Europe and Germany to remind our friends of uh, the shared history and the ideals that unite us in the West. While celebrating these bonds, the second principle um, is that we expect those 
uh, whom we help not to aid and abet our rivals. Western Europeans cannot simply continue to depend, to deepen their energy dependence uh, on the same Russia um, that we're seeing um, spreading malign influence uh, in the world today. Um, we also can't expect our allies to enrich themselves um, through corrupt business deals through countries like uh, Russia um, and so on. The same holds true for Central Europeans. It's not acceptable for US allies in Central Europe to support projects like Nord Stream 2 or Turk Stream 2 and maintain cozy nuclear deals uh, that make the region more vulnerable uh, to Russia. Uh, and this again, Russia is of course the reason many of these countries join NATO to protect themselves against this country. Uh, many of our closest allies in Central Europe already operate networks of corruption and state-owned enterprises that rig the system in favor of China and Russia. This creates an uneven playing field for US companies. I'm grateful to say that Poland is not one of these countries, and we're very grateful for the open and competitive business climate here in Poland that allows U.S. companies to um, participate uh, here and, and uh, create. Third, the United States will respect the national independence. The third principle is that the United States will respect the national independence and sovereignty of our allies. Um, we will continue to honor the right of every nation to pursue its own customs, beliefs, and traditions. We're not interested in zero-sum games. Uh, for too long, many in the West have touted international institutions without acknowledging that they derive their authority and legitimacy from the nation state. It is the nation, it is in the nation um, that democratic accountability resides. Of course, many of you know, the United States has a long tradition of supporting the right of nations to choose their own destiny. And we fought for this right in 1917. Uh, we defended it in World War II. And of course, our entire strategy throughout the Cold War um, was based on this. Our grand strategy against the Soviet empire, for instance, was predicated on the belief that nations are unique repositories of legitimacy and liberty, and thus we ought to protect and nurture them. Historically, powerful democracies have stood for the rights of small nations on grounds of both principle and interest, while large authoritarian powers have consistently opposed them. Today, it is the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of frontier states like Ukraine, Georgia, and your neighbor Belarus that offer the surest bulwark against Russian neo-imperialism. And it is the nation states of Europe that are role models of economic growth and will decide the future of Europe and its institutions. The idea that a large authoritarian power like China or Russia um, could become a sincere champion of true national independence is simply unthinkable. Um, both these countries operate on authoritarian geopolitical traditions antithetical to the freedom of nations like Poland. Our allies in Central Europe must, be, must not be under any illusion that these um, countries are their friends. The West, and I'm talking about the United States and our other allies, it's our responsibility to reclaim the tradition of supporting the nation state and its own, uh, as, as its own and work harder to ensure that international institutions reflect the democratic will of nations um, and expect, or if we don't do this, we should expect these instant international institutions to lose influence and relevance in the 21st century. The fourth and final principle I'd like to discuss is the United States, the United States expects other states to respect the rights of their neighbors. And we reject Russia's territorial aggression in Ukraine, and we reject Chinese predatory debt mongering throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Neither of these authoritarian powers want relations with truly independent states, um, much less allies. What they want are dependencies and relationships, dependent relationships. For NATO allies like Poland, our message is clear. Um, U.S. commitment to Article 5 is ironclad. And for non-NATO partners, our message is equally clear. We will support your right for national independence and sovereignty. Like I said, we're not interested in zero-sum games. We stand by your right to make your own choices about your sovereignty and your independence, especially when they're being disrespected by countries like Russia. We stand by Ukraine and Georgia, um, which I believe is demonstrated by the aid and the arms that we've made available to these states. As we have in past decades, we will continue to help those who help themselves in the struggle for freedom. And I'd like to repeat that unlike our rivals, we're not looking for dependencies. Um, we seek strong allies and partners that are free, independent, and confident, and willing and able to share the burden of the common defense. Um, and in closing, I'd like to em emphasize that only strong and confident allies will be able to, in the words of the NATO Charter, safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples in the area of competition that is unfolding before us. With strong allies like Poland and supported by the love of freedom that is the West's greatest legacy, uh, we can prevail in this area of global competition against uh, countries like Russia and China. <laughs>
So those are my very formal diplomatic remarks, and I'd like now to move on to the, the next stage with the, our moderator's permission. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Richard, for, for your opening remarks. Uh, so we can now move to the question and answers, uh, answer, question and answer section. And uh, if you have any question you'd like to ask to Richard, please type it into the chat window. And I see that we already have a question from Professor David Jones, who asks you, how do you think uh, b between Russia, and, Russia and, and China, uh, in your opinion, which one is the greatest danger to the U.S. and to the West generally? Well, that's that's a, a, a difficult question. I think it depends a lot on definition of, of threat and danger. I think China and Russia play very different roles in Europe. Um, China, as we've seen, excuse me, Russia, as we've seen in Ukraine uh, and elsewhere in Europe and the Baltic states, is much more aggressive. And I think it perceives itself uh, in a descendant pattern, whereas China probably perceives itself uh, in an ascendant pattern. China, I think, is playing a much longer game and recognizes that economic tools are probably um, the best way for it to interact with the world to um, increase its influence in places like Europe. Russia, I think, as we're seeing, is increasingly desperate. And maybe that's perhaps what makes it more, more dangerous to countries uh, like Poland, because it is grasping to maintain its influence um, the, which is quickly evaporating on this continent. Um, the main thing, main, I, as I alluded to in my remarks, the thing that makes the United States uh, strong in the world is not so much our military or our economic mind, but is our soft power. It's what we are selling to the world. And Russia, unfortunately, doesn't have much to sell to the world. Um, when countries engage with it economically, they're subject to the export of corruption and problems and oftentimes uh, coercive business and, and economic policies. That's simply not appealing to many countries. And so we are fortunate the fact that um, Russia engages the West in that way. And I believe the West has very much uh, following Crimea, following the Skripal poisoning, things like this, has woken up um, to Russia's malign influence and the way it sows influence in the West and the byproducts and side effects of that influence. Um, China, as we've seen, doesn't necessarily engage in those aggressive activities, but is still playing a longer game, buying influence where it can, investing in infrastructure, purchasing companies, investing in Europe. So in the longer term, it might be that China is the greater threat, but in the near term, um, when it comes to you know, basic uh, aggression, warfare, things like this, it's, it's clearly Russia. But in the long term, we might be talking more about China. And I think that the world in general is waking up to that reality and recognizing the fact that Russia prevents a, a very real and immediate threat to uh, peace-loving countries, um, market economies, and national sovereignty, whereas China is, is a more likely long-term pernicious threat. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a quick follow-up question from Professor Jones. Um, he asks, what can be done to slow or stop China's death book diplomacy. Can you define this? Well, unfortunately, I am not an expert on China, um, but we do have an expert uh, at the MC, and maybe that would be an appropriate follow-on uh, event to talk to her. Um, but what we're seeing uh, China do is something that's very common uh, throughout the world, whereby they invest in critical infrastructure, things like ports, um, roads, uh, electrical grids, uh, and first of all, these these items are not the the financing. Uh, I should say probably first is often very favorable uh, to these countries because this these financing is often backed by the Chinese government. So there's almost uh, no interest often in payback for loans, um, but often the the quality of this infrastructure is very very low. Um, oftentimes, when they're involved in uh, critical infrastructure. Um, you can expect, for instance, if it's electronic infrastructure or technological infrastructure, you can expect that um, any information sent on that, that infrastructure will be being sent directly to Beijing, despite protestations made by these companies that they might protect your privacy. Um, the reality is that the Chinese government has inroads in all many of the, if not all of these companies and is able to use that information. Uh, this is a primary concern we have about the 5G. Uh, which of course is the future for telecommunications. 
And China is making what many countries consider to be very attractive offers for 5G infrastructure throughout Europe through uh, their company Huawei, which you'll see advertised throughout Poland um, very effectively. Um, so ways that we can counteract this, um, that's what we're still trying to figure out. And we have to be honest with ourselves that if um, China has been successful, it's probably because we in the West have not offered a sufficiently attractive alternative. And that is one thing we need to do. And we need to make a, a more clear and more explicit message to our allies throughout Europe that there are alternatives to uh, Chinese financing and um, Chinese infrastructure. So I, I think the United States and our Western partners might be a little bit behind the curve. Maybe we haven't foreseen um, the future as closely um, as, as we would have liked to counteract that. But uh, China has been very prescient and very clever um, and playing, again, they're playing a very long and strategic game. And so we need to simply present better alternatives um, with the understanding that not only will the technology and infrastructure be higher quality, but it comes with the assurances that um, it's not an open door to the United, to other countries to have that private information and that it won't represent an intrusion or a violation of a given country's sovereignty. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from, from Professor Mazurkiewicz. Um, she's interested in uh, what are the new instruments of soft power uh, that might be developed or used by the USA nowadays? We know that, as you said in your presentation, one of the greatest strengths of, of USA was the soft power which was uh, vigorously developed until the end of the 20th century. What are the new instruments uh, that are used now? Yeah. Well, we're using one right now. It's this wonderful thing by an American country called Google Meet. And especially right now in this situation, the pandemic, we're finding all sorts of ways to reach out to people and to talk to people like you to share the message of the United States. Um, I'm not an expert on soft power. That's what people like Beata and Elizabeth specialize in. Uh, but the fact is we need to find new and innovative ways to share our message with the world. And thankfully, we in the United States benefit from a, a, wonderful, a wonderful entrepreneurial climate um, that creates um, these attractive opportunities uh, from American companies. Um, I've often said that I, I'm not concerned so much about um, countries like Russia, so long as I know that Russians are eating Big Macs and listening to Beyonce on their iPhones. Um, the fact is American culture is in an, is proliferating throughout the world and along with that comes our influence. So in many ways, it's simply the attractiveness of our culture, which I believe continues um, throughout the world. But we as a government need to do a better job of explaining ourselves and telling our story. Um, if Chinese and Russian alternatives are attractive, are more attractive to other countries, and that is our fault in the West that we haven't made the case clear to developing countries where they should cast their lot and where they should have their closer ties. I want to again make it clear that we're not an interest in zero-sum games. There's no reason that a country like Ukraine, for instance, shouldn't have strong economic, cultural, and um, lingu lingual ties with a country like Russia. But it's really interesting to see um, the fact that despite that shared history, or perhaps because of it, or, or despite those language and family ties, countries like Ukraine are much more interested in uh, association agreements with the EU than they are with continued integration and customs agreements and um, a membership in the Eurasian e economic space. Um, you might wonder why that is, and I think it's clearly because of the appeal of the Western model and what they've seen um, in corruption and other negative aspects of the Russian model. So Ukrainians are making a choice um, they will continue to speak um, Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, they will continue to have strong uh, cultural ties to Russia and the former Soviet Union. But it's clear that when it comes to a political situation, they're looking westward. And I think that is a very excellent um, illustration of the efficacy of soft power. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, uh, this time from Ambassador Schnapp. Uh, could you try to evaluate the US-EU relations? And is the dilemma to stay with the US or EU real? I guess the dilemma at least concerted to some countries in our uh, in our part of Europe. Yeah, I, I suppose 
I don't know that that's, that's a dilemma that I've perceived for countries in Europe. Again, we're not interested in zero-sum games, and the EU is a strong partner for the United States, and I believe that many of the values that have brought the European Union member states together um, are shared with the United States. So a, a country like Poland, for instance, is an active and important member of the European Union, but is also becoming has already been and will continue to be a very important ally for the United States. So for me, there's not a dichotomy between the United States and the EU. I think we're very close allies. Um, there are obvious, um, I suppose I, I should say there are some natural rivalries and competitions between countries in the EU and the United States. Um, but that doesn't mean there's a dilemma or a choice forced upon countries in the EU uh, or outside the EU on its periphery uh, to choose between us. I would imagine that most countries would want to have a very strong relationship with both because it makes sense um, and it's simply a, a practical matter. Um, likewise, the EU and the United States have a very strong pragmatic relationship. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Frank. Uh, I guess this question does not directly relate to the U.S. foreign policy in Eastern Central Europe, but I guess that uh, it is asked because your expert is in, in Russian efforts as well. So the question is, how seriously has COVID and the drop of oil prices affected the Russian economy? And I would add to this question, if I may, uh, do you think it may somehow undermine Russian political position in, in, in this part of, of, of the world? Well, as I'm not an economic expert, but um, looking at Russia, I think it's certainly clear that their economy is not diversified. And so any drop in um, energy prices, particularly gas and oil, is going to affect that economy very seriously. Uh, and the fact is, we've all been affected by the COVID pandemic. Every country in this world has been affected very severely economically by the COVID pandemic. And so a country like Russia, that is basically a petrol state, is going to be affected very seriously by a drop in energy prices. Um, so much so because it, it lacks diversity, it lacks uh, the flexibility to address. And let's, let's be clear about the companies that manage Russia's um, energy resources. They're terribly inefficient to begin with. And so they will, and many of them uh, are corrupt. And so they're, they're facing um, competing economic and political priorities as they receive direction from the state, uh, from the Russian state. So I'm certain that that will undermine the government as standard of living continues to stagnate in Russia. We've already seen significant drops in support for President Putin in Russia. So it's not a surprise to me that we would continue to see a lack of support for the Russian state um, in the middle of this pandemic. The Russian response to COVID-19 has also left a lot to be desired. They were very late to the game. Um, I mean, we're talking a month or two after Poland was in a state of lockdown, uh, Russia finally decided to take this seriously. So I think we're only really beginning to see the beginning of the pandemic in Russia and how strongly it's going to affect that country remains to be seen. Um, but I believe it will be a very serious uh, effect on their economy, also on their health situation. The Russian um, health industry, public health industry, has many, many problems um, that have simply not been addressed since the fall of the Soviet Union and in some ways have been exacerbated. So Russia, which is a country um, which has many problems that its, refuse, that its government refuses to address, um, could really be facing many problems on many fronts and a very dissatisfied population. Thank you very much. Now we have another question from Ambassador Schnepp, but uh, I think it's a good policy, uh, at least from my, my point of view of a moderator, to, to give as many people as possible opportunity to, to um, ask you a question. Therefore, uh, I will put the question of Daria Malets first. And uh, she asks, what are your thoughts about this just announced U.S. withdrawal from World Health Organization? Well, that is a, a broader topic. Um, and all, all I can say about that is it's clear that our president and our elected leaders were unhappy with their relationship with the World Health Organization. and. Um, we're dissatisfied with um, 
some of the information they were receiving from the World Health Organization. And that is um, part and parcel, um, as you're all aware, of living in a democracy that our government made a decision. And um, I, as a diplomat, um, um, and don't have very much information about the internal thinking on that decision. Um, so I can't ter tell you terribly much more about that other than this is a decision made obviously by our elected officials um, based on their reasoning. And so I, I frankly don't have a position or I'm not really prepared to discuss that today. I apologize. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, do we have any, any other um, questions? Remember, you can always type them in the chat window and in the meantime, I have a question uh, to ask you. Well, uh, the, in uh, the latest report of the Freedom House that was just published a couple of weeks ago, Poland has been classified, I think for the first time since like early 1990s, as a non-consolidated democracy. Now, mm -hmm. uh, how could this affect the U.S. policy towards, towards our country? Ah, uh, I, I don't think it'll affect it terribly. I think we're committed to Poland. Uh, I think we um, here at the embassy in Poland understand the situation politically and what's happening in Poland and we observe it. Um, and it, it's fairly clear to us um, that Poland is a thriving democracy with a variety of voices and a spectrum of, of press reporting different points of views and different information, a free press. And so our policy towards Poland is that this is still a strong, vibrant, free country and a very important ally in Europe. Um, so we respect the work of organizations like Freedom House and they, they conduct their own reports on the United States and our own ranking in those reports fluctuates year to year um, based on what's happening. And of course, that's what happens in democracies and free countries that um, we are, you know, things change year to year and those can often give perceptions to observers and they have their concerns about what's happening. Uh, and that's totally fine. And our governments do their best to address the sorts of concerns as do opposition parties, as do our civil society and our citizens. So um, it, it won't affect the relationship with Poland. Our relationship with Poland is based on so many common interests. Um, and, you know, we, we understand that um, U.S.-based NGOs will criticize Poland, and we hope and expect that um, Polish-based NGOs will evaluate and criticize what's happening in the United States. That's just how it works with partners, um, especially partners that are you know, committed to democracy and freedom. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let, let me go back to um, another question by Ambassador Schnepf. Uh, he asks you, what are your thoughts about the sugar law in Poland? As it, it affects the U.S. companies, and I guess that he, he even specified this, that uh, you mentioned your, in your talk about the excellent business environment offered in Poland. Uh, so what do you think of, of that? Uh, so, so the U.S. Embassy, we tend to be divided by topics, and unfortunately, I don't handle any of the economic portfolio. So it's an excellent question. And maybe I can volunteer one of my colleagues from our economic section to come discuss um, the economic issues that uh, kind of underpin our relationship. And I, I wouldn't feel comfortable discussing their topics here with you today. I apologize. But um, that is a very interesting topic. And I'm, I'm sure they would be happy to come discuss economic diplomacy and the business relationship um, between the United States and Poland. We also have representatives of our foreign commercial service um, here in uh, Poland. So they could also discuss um, the uh, business and economic relationship between the Poland and the United States. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we have another question from Katzper. Uh, one thing that would change the most if the U.S. stopped supporting Central Eastern Europe. Uh, so, I'm not really sure if I understand your question fully, Katzper. I understand it as what would be the what would be like one most important thing that would would change the most if United States simply stopped supporting Central and Eastern Europe. Mm. How would that affect the situation of of this part of the continent politically, economically speaking? Well, that's that, that's a very speculative question. I unfortunately, much to my regret, I don't have a crystal ball, um, so I don't think I, I'm in a position to speculate about how uh, the political or economic or security dynamic would change in Europe. 
uh, without the United States. But I think the United States would like to think that um, our presence here now, um, and by presence, I mean obviously our diplomatic presence, as well as our economic presence, as well as our security presence um, in the form of NATO troops, both in Poland and Germany, elsewhere in Europe, um, add stability to the continent. Um, I think there are plenty of instances um, in the 20th century alone um, where we've seen aggression from Eastern countries and countries um, in Europe um, because these countries did not have the sorts of alliances that would protect them. Thankfully, much of Europe now are members of NATO, and thankfully we now have that reliable relationship. We have Article 5, we have these security guarantees. Um, I would like to think that these agreements um, continue to add to that stability um, for countries like Poland. Um, I, I'm not saying that without NATO, um, we countries in Europe would face a situation like Ukraine. Um, but the situation in Ukraine serves as an important example for what can happen um, when we are not together in terms of collective bargain and collective agreements on security and things like that. Um, likewise, I think it's hugely beneficial to uh, the EU and other European states to have trade with the United States, to have market economies and open relationships where we can share information, where we can share technology, uh, where we can share practices. I think these benefit both countries and they go both ways. So I, I don't see a world where the United States and Europe uh, are no longer involved, where we're no longer um, so closely linked that we depend on each other for um, you know, business and investment, for security. I think this is a situation that benefits us all and contributes to all of our safety and our stability. Thank you. Uh, now, w one more question I'd like to ask you is um, this. There was a lot of talk about this, this famous pivot in American foreign policy during Obama administration, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This change of fundamental change of priorities and the, the focus of interest of American pol foreign policy from Europe to Asia. Now, would you say this pivot has actually happened if, and if it did, is it like permanent or not really? Well, the, the so-called rebalance uh, to Asia was, was definitely uh, a product of the previous presidential administration in the United States, uh, and it did get a lot of attention. And I think it's not so much, I think perhaps that was a failure on our part to, uh, to phrase it that way, um, because the reality wasn't that we were shifting attention from, let's say, Europe to Asia. I think it was more a, a long overdue need to... Um, devote significant attention to the Asian continent in the 21st century. Um, obviously, um, with China growing as quickly as it is, um, especially in economic terms, um, also it's growing military, we can't ignore China. We also have massive, very important allies in Asia, like South Korea, like Japan, like the Philippines. And so it's important to reassure those allies and let them know that we are paying attention. So I think it was less of a rebalance or a pivot and more simply a recognition that the United States needs to expand its capacity to not only engage with Europe, but also to engage with Asian allies in a similar manner. So that that relationship in terms of security, um, in terms of economics, is equal and strong and growing and that they know that it's a priority for us just like our relationship with the eu and the united kingdom and countries like poland is um, so i i would say that it was simply a failure on our part to to phrase it that way um, and, and it reflects more accurately our commitment to engaging asia um, more as an equal partner and an increasing um, just increasing our engagement there, not to the detriment of Europe and our allies. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have another question from Zofia um, about the state of democracy and, 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 and constitutional reforms in Russia. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. about this? Well, my thoughts about the state of democracy in Russia are terribly bleak. Um, I, I don't think we can call Russia a democracy. It hasn't had a free or fair election since 1996. And um, so we have, we in the United States government are obviously concerned about that. Uh, my time in Moscow was focused on human rights issues. Um, as you can imagine, that was um, a very difficult portfolio um, to, to address in that country. 
Um, the fact is the Russian government is interested in the appearance of democracy and not actual democracy. Um, this is partially so that countries like the United States will stop criticizing them. Um, so they will have what they call elections and things like that. But even if these elections were to be free and fair, what we're seeing now uh, with the constitutional amendments um, are there to ensure uh, that Russia's establishment and that those in the ruling class right now remain in power as long as they want to be in power. So it's, it's obvious that um, Russia is no longer democracy, which is unfortunate because I love Russia. It's a wonderful country with um, incredible culture, delicious food, and great people. Um, but unfortunately, the Russian government sees fit um, to not let them participate in the governance of their own country and to participate in real elections and to have a real choice in the governing of their country. So I, I am not optimistic. Um, I think these constitutional reforms are simply there to find a convenient way and somewhat uh, legally justifiable way to allow Vladimir Putin to remain in power as long as he wants to be, regardless of what his own population wants. Thank you. And uh, another question from Anna this time, uh, it's a rather complex one. Uh, she claims that, you know, it used to be that, that the governments had greater uh, possibilities of, of, of kind of controlling their image and controlling to some extent the media uh, uh, covering many things uh, uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, now, the question is, how is U.S. managing to still promote this American way of life, right? Do this soft power policy mm -hmm. with all the social media being around and events such as those those late uh, tragic events connected with George Floyd's death and mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter uh, protests happening? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Let me first re-correct uh, re uh, correct my uh, statement. There actually hasn't been a free or fair election in Russia since 91. Uh, the one in 96 was definitely not free or fair. Um, but that's a very good question. And this is a challenge we face um, in the United States, um, which is, you know, how do we innovate? How do we show, um, how do we spread the soft power? Um, and so government inherently is not, is not as flexible as it should be. And so we as the United States government struggle to find new ways to tell our story. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we're very fortunate to benefit from our entrepreneurial class uh, in the United States that comes with these, comes up with these innovative ways so that our citizens, completely independent of their government, uh, can share their lives and their stories with you here in Poland or really any other country that has an internet connection. And so that is a huge advantage to us. And we're also seeing this being used in, in countries like Iran and others um, where their own citizens are using Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook to spread democracy, to spread freedom, and spread information as much as they can. Um, so it, it, that, that is one way um, that we are sharing our, our soft power throughout the world, um, which is not led by our government. And again, our civil society and our entrepreneurial class are the ones who truly lead the way in many ways um, in that regard. Um, and I think what you've alluded to um, is an interesting paradox of, of the American situation right now because our citizens, just like um, any citizens anywhere else, are able to use their smartphones to um, document the things that are going on, these protests about um, the death of George Floyd um, to the whole world. And that, I believe, the fact that they can do that, the fact that they can demonstrate, the fact that we as Americans can demonstrate criticize our government, um, express our dissatisfaction with some aspects of American life is in many ways a tribute to the American system. So if I'm a, a Russian um, or a Chinese member of government and I'm looking at what's happening in the United States, I might be very pleased um, that some of the difficult aspects of American life are being shared internationally uh, in real time and are documented and reported. But at the same time, our citizens have that capability. Uh, which speaks to our freedom of speech, our freedom of expression, expression and our ability to do these things without being arrested. Um, I would have no, if I were, you know, protesting in the United States and, and were filming it on Instagram or Twitter or something like that, I would know that I would not be arrested. I would have no fears about being arrested for doing that. That simply wouldn't be the case in a country like Russia or China. 
Um, in China, for instance, we still don't have many facts, many much information about what happened in Tiananmen Square over 30 years ago um, is just not known. We don't know how many people were arrested, how many people were killed. An event like that simply couldn't happen in the United States these days. Um, and even with all these smartphones now, I wonder if that could happen in China, if, if uh, an event on that scale could happen. So it is a paradox, um, but I think it, it reflects um, U.S. citizens' ability um, to, to share um, their lives in a way that, you know, as we say, warts and all, um, all the negative and positive aspects about our lives, they are free to do so. They have that freedom of speech, that freedom of expression, which is constitutionally pr protected. Thank you very much. Now, do we have any other questions? You can type your question in the chat window if you have one. I think we have um, another question from Maria. Um, and w what do you think about Donald Trump wanting to declare Antifa as a terrorist organization? Mm. Um, unfortunately, that's another question that kind of falls outside the bounds of foreign policy. Um, but of course, you're, you're aware that uh, the United States government does from time to time designate um, organizations like Hezbollah uh, as um, terror organizations. It's a long, it's a legal process. Um, so I will say that if um, the president does want to designate Antifa as a domestic terrorist organization. That's a long legal process. At this point, what we have is a tweet um, indicating that um, he would like to do so. But like I said, it's a very long, difficult process, legal process. Um, they will take into many different points of views and must be based in, in facts and evidence and things like that to do so. And has very and, and there's good reasons for that because it has really strong implications for those organizations. So. At this stage, there's not really much I can say about that because that tweet was made, I think, just last weekend, I think Sunday. Um, and so, um, as often happens, uh, the tweets come ahead of the policy these days in the United States. So it's, it's really difficult to speculate what the path forward is on that. But um, we in the United States government would, would obviously expect um, due process to be applied in that situation, just like it would be in any other organization that we want to, for any other organization that we would want to designate as a terrorist organization. Thank you. I think we still have a time for maybe the last question. Sure. So this is this is your opportunity. Uh, I'm asking students and faculty members if you'd like to ask Richard anything else. And let me just say also that um, you know some of these questions are coming up about our domestic political situation. As you all know, we we will have a presidential election in November. Um, that's always a very interesting time. Uh, every election is interesting. Um, so further down the road, if, if we're able to do that, I think it would be uh, beneficial maybe for someone from the embassy to come on here um, and meet with you again to discuss uh, the American political system and our elections and discuss some of these questions a little in, great, in greater detail. Okay. Are there any more questions? Well, if there is no more question, oh, we, we have, I guess, the last one. Uh, so what consequences to U.S.-Russian relations might U.S. leaving Open Skies Treaty have? Open Skies Treaty have? Um, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. Uh, the Open Skies Treaty um, basically reflects the fact that we have already very poor relations with Russia, um, and that was Russia's decision um, to have poor relations with us. Um, the, as you're aware, of course, we left the Open Skies Treaty because Russia was no longer keeping the treaty, and so we no longer saw it uh, beneficial to uh, maintain that treaty. But the fact is our relationship with Russia is in a very bad state, and that has um, almost nothing to do with the Open Skies Treaty. Um, that has more to do with continual bad behavior by the Russian government. Um, as, you, as many of you have probably observed about the American domestic political situation, uh, our two main political parties very rarely agree on anything. But I'll tell you one thing they agree on, which is how unhappy they were that the Russian government tried to hack our and influence our 2016 presidential election. It's very rare that you see uh, our Congress voting unanimously on anything, and they have voted unanimously on sanctions against Russia time and time again. Um, so the state of that relationship is not strong. And that has to do with the fact that Russia has time and time again tried to build malign influence in the United States as well as in our allies 
and continues uh, military aggression in Ukraine and continues to lie about it. So our relationship is not strong, it is not positive, but that has nothing to do with the Open Skies Treaty, I'm afraid. Thank you. Now, uh, as 5 p.m. has passed, I think we can slowly conclude this meeting. I'd like to thank you very much for your very interesting uh, talk and, and, and answers to, to the questions. Now, I have been repeating this for years now as a teacher involved in you know, teaching American politics. I've been repeating this to my students that um, this kind of knowledge and expertise you have to offer is something they can never get from simply studying chapters in American government handbook. Uh, this, this kind of knowledge is, is, is knowledge that only insider can offer, and this is why it is really priceless and, and possible to obtain only through uh, direct meetings and events like this. Uh, so uh, thank you very much once again, and I again I would like to thank um, U.S. Embassy Warsaw for help in organizing this event. Uh, I'd like to thank all participants in this session and. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. And, and let me reciprocate my gratitude to you. Thank you. Um, the only, I mean, it's the same for us. The only way we learn um, is by being able to interact directly through, um, you know, in terms of understanding foreign policy and the political situation here in Poland is by talking to experts here. So I, I benefit every day um, from talking to experts at places like the University of Warsaw and the various think tanks and institutions present in Poland. So thank you for your time and being willing to engage in this dialogue today. Thank you very much.